Speaker, before I come to the substance of my statement, I am sure the whole House will wish to join me in offering our heartfelt condolences to the family and friends of Sergeant Matt Tonro from the 3rd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment, who was killed by an improvised explosive device on the 29th of March. Sergeant Tonro was embedded with US forces on a counter Daesh operation. He served his country with great distinction, and it is clear he was a gifted and intelligent instructor. Theresa May is holding an emergency debate with lawmakers. She's called the hearing in an attempt to defend her decision to take part in Friday's bombing of Syria with the U.S. and France. Let's listen in as she prepares to give her remarks. I would like to make a statement on the actions that we have taken together with our American and French allies to degrade the Syrian regime's chemical weapons capabilities and to deter their future use. On Saturday, the 7th of April, up to 75 people, including young children, were killed in a horrific attack in Douma, with as many as 500 further casualties. All indications are that this was a chemical weapons attack. UK medical and scientific experts have analysed open source reports, images and video footage from the incident, and concluded that the victims were exposed to a toxic chemical. This is corroborated by first-hand accounts from NGOs and aid workers. While the World Health Organisation received reports that hundreds of patients arrived at Syrian health facilities on Saturday night with signs and symptoms consistent with exposure to toxic chemicals. And based on our assessment, we do not think that these reports could be falsified on this scale. Furthermore, Mr Speaker, the Syrian regime has reportedly been attempting to conceal the evidence by searching evacuees from Douma to ensure samples are not being smuggled from this area. And a wider operation to conceal the facts of the attack is underway, supported by the Russians. Mr Speaker, the images of this suffering are utterly haunting. Innocent families, seeking shelter in underground bunkers, found dead with foam in their mouths, burns to their eyes, and their bodies surrounded by a chlorine-like odour. Children gasping for life as chemicals choked their lungs. The fact that such an atrocity can take place in our world today is a stain on our humanity. And we are clear about who is responsible. A significant body of information, including intelligence, indicates the Syrian regime is responsible for this latest attack. Open source accounts state that barrel bombs were used to deliver the chemicals. Barrel bombs are usually delivered by helicopters. Multiple open source reports and intelligence indicates that regime helicopters operated over Douma on the evening of the 7th of April, shortly before reports emerged in social media of a chemical attack. And the Syrian military officials coordinated what appears to be the use of chlorine weapons. Mr Speaker, no other group could have carried out this attack. The opposition does not operate helicopters or use barrel bombs. <clears throat> Daesh does not even have a presence in Douma. And the reports of this attack are consistent with previous regime attacks. These include the attack on the 21st of August 2013, where over 800 people were killed and thousands more injured in a chemical attack also in Ghouta. Fourteen further smaller-scale chemical attacks reported prior to that summer. Three further chlorine attacks in 2014 and 2015, which the independent UNSC mandated investigation attributed to the regime. And the attack at Khan Sheikhoun on the 4th of April last year, where the Syrian regime used sarin against its people, killing around 100 with a further 500 casualties. Based on the regime's persistent pattern of behaviour and the cumulative analysis of specific incidents, we judged it highly likely that the Syrian regime had continued to use chemical weapons on at least four occasions since the attack in Khan Sheikhoun, and we judged that they would have continued to do so. So we needed to intervene rapidly to alleviate further indiscriminate humanitarian suffering. Mr Speaker, we have explored every possible diplomatic channel to do so, but our efforts have been repeatedly thwarted. Following the Sarin attack in eastern Damascus back in August 2013, the Syrian regime committed to dismantle its chemical weapon programme, and Russia promised to ensure that Syria did this, overseen by the Organisation for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. At the weekend, the Leader of the Opposition cited this diplomatic agreement as a precedent that this process can work. But this process did not work. 
it did not eradicate the chemical weapons capability of the Syrian regime, with only last month the OPCW finding that Syria's declaration of its former chemical weapons programme is incomplete. And as I have already set out, it did not stop the Syrian regime from carrying out the most abhorrent atrocities using these weapons. Furthermore, on each occasion when we have seen every sign of chemical weapons being used, Russia has blocked any attempt to hold the perpetrators to account at the UN Security Council, with six such vetoes since the start of 2017. And just last week, Russia blocked a UN resolution that would have established an independent investigation able to determine responsibility for this latest attack. So, regrettably, we had no choice but to conclude that diplomatic action on its own is not going to work. The Leader of the Opposition has said that he can only countenance involvement in Syria if there is UN authority behind it. The House should be clear. That would mean a Russian veto on our foreign policy. When the Cabinet met on Thursday, we considered the advice of the Attorney General. Based on this advice, we agreed that it was not just morally right but also legally right to take military action, together with our closest allies, to alleviate further humanitarian suffering. This was not about intervening in a civil war, and it was not about regime change. It was about a limited, targeted and effective strike that sought to alleviate the humanitarian suffering of the Syrian people by degrading the Syrian regime's chemical weapons capability and deterring their use. And we have published the legal basis for this action. It required three conditions to be met. First, there must be convincing evidence generally accepted by the international community as a whole of extreme humanitarian distress on a large scale, requiring immediate and urgent relief. Second, it must be objectively clear that there is no practicable alternative to the use of force if lives are to be saved. And third, the proposed use of force must be necessary and proportionate to the aim of relief of humanitarian suffering and must be strictly limited in time and in scope to this aim. These are the same three criteria used as the legal justification for the UK's role in the NATO intervention in Kosovo. Our intervention in 1991 with the US and France and in 1992 with the US to create safe havens and enforce the no-fly zones in Iraq following the Gulf War were also justified on the basis of humanitarian intervention. So governments of all colours have long considered that military action on an exceptional basis, where necessary and proportionate, and as a last resort to avert an overwhelming humanitarian catastrophe, is permissible under international law. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I have set out why we are convinced by the evidence and why there was no practicable alternative. Let me set out how this military response was also proportionate. This was a limited, targeted and effective strike that would significantly degrade Syrian chemical weapons capabilities and deter their future use, and with clear boundaries that expressly sought to avoid escalation and did everything possible to prevent civilian casualties. As a result, the coordinated actions of the US, UK and France were successfully and specifically targeted at three sites. Contrary to what the Leader of the Opposition said at the weekend, these were not empty buildings. The first was the Baza branch of the Scientific Studies and Research Centre in northern Damascus. This was a centre for the research and development of Syria's chemical and biological programme. It was hit by 57 American T-LAMs and 19 American JASSMs. The second site was the Him Shinzar chemical weapons bunkers, 15 miles west of the city of Homs, which contained both a chemical weapons equipment and storage facility and an important command post. These were successfully hit by seven French scalp cruise missiles. And the third site was the Him Shinzar chemical weapons storage site and former missile base, which is now a military facility. This was assessed to be a location of Syrian sarin and precursor production equipment, whose destruction would degrade Syria's ability to deliver sarin in the future. This was hit by nine US T-LAMs, five naval and two scalp missile, cruise missiles from France, and eight storm shadow missiles launched by R4 RAF Tornado GR4s. Very careful scientific analysis was used to determine where best to target these missiles to maximise the destruction of stockpiled chemicals and to minimise any risk to the rat surrounding area. And the facility that we targeted is located some distance from any known population centres, reducing yet further any such risk of civilian casualties. 
Mr. Speaker, while targeted and limited, these strikes by the US, UK and France were significantly larger than the US action a year ago after the attack at Khan Sheikhoun, and specifically designed to have a greater impact on the regime's capability and willingness to use chemical weapons. We also minimise the chances of wider escalation through our carefully targeted approach, and the House will note that Russia has not reported any losses of personnel or equipment as a result of these strikes. I am sure the whole House will want to join me in paying tribute to all the British service men and women and their, and their American and French allies who successfully carried out this mission with such courage and professionalism. Mr Speaker, let me deal specifically with three important questions. First, why did we not wait for the investigation from the OPCW? UNSC mandated inspectors have investigated previous attacks and on four occasions decided that the regime was indeed responsible. We are confident in our own assessment that the Syrian regime was highly likely responsible for this attack and that its persistent pattern of behaviour meant that it was highly likely to continue using chemical weapons. Furthermore, there were clearly attempts to block any proper investigation, as we saw with the Russian veto at the UN earlier in the week. And let me set this out in detail. We support strongly the work of the OPCW fact-finding mission that is currently in Damascus. But that mission is only able to make an assessment of whether chemical weapons were used. Even if the OPCW team is able to visit Douma to gather information to make that assessment, and they are currently being prevented from doing so by the regime and the Russians, it cannot attribute responsibility. This is because Russia vetoed in November 2017 an extension of the joint investigatory mechanism set up to do this. And last week, in the wake of the Duma attack, it again vetoed a new UNSC resolution to re-establish such a mechanism. And even if we had OPCW's findings and a mechanism to attribute, for as long as Russia continues to veto, the UN Security Council still would not be able to act. So, Mr Speaker, we cannot wait to alleviate further humanitarian suffering caused by chemical weapons attacks. Second, were we not just following orders from America? Let me be absolutely clear. We have acted because it is in our national interest to do so. It is in our national interest to prevent the further use of chemical weapons in Syria and to uphold and defend the global consensus that these weapons should not be used. For we cannot allow the use of chemical weapons to become normalised, either within Syria, on the streets of the UK or elsewhere. So we have not done this because President Trump asked us to do so. We have done it because we believed it was the right thing to do, and we are not alone. There is broad-based international support for the action we have taken. NATO has issued a statement setting out its support, as have the Gulf Cooperation Council and a number of countries in the region. And over the weekend, I have spoken to a range of world leaders, including Chancellor Merkel, Prime Minister Gentiloni, Prime Minister Trudeau, Prime Minister Turnbull, and European Council, Union Council President Donald Tusk. All have expressed their support for the actions that Britain, France, and America have taken. Third, why did we not recall Parliament? Mr. Speaker, the speed with which we acted was essential in cooperating with our partners to alleviate further humanitarian suffering and to maintain the vital security of our operations. This was a limited, targeted strike on a legal basis that has been used before, and it was a decision which required the evaluation of intelligence and information, much of which was of a nature that could not be shared with Parliament. We have always been clear that the Government has the right to act quickly in the national interest. <laughs> I am absolutely clear, Mr Speaker, that it is Parliament's responsibility to hold me to account for such decisions, and Parliament will do so. But it is my responsibility as Prime Minister to make these decisions, and I will make them. Mr Speaker, as I have been clear, this military action was not about intervening in the civil war in Syria or about regime change. But we are determined to do our utmost to help resolve the conflict in Syria. That means concluding the fight against Daesh, which still holds pockets of territory in Syria. It means working to enable humanitarian access and continuing our efforts at the forefront of global response, where the UK has already committed almost £2.5 billion, our largest ever response to a single humanitarian crisis. And next week, we will attend the second Brussels conference on supporting the future of Syria and the region, 
which will focus on humanitarian support, bolstering the UN-led political process in Geneva, and ensuring continued international support to refugees and host countries, driving forward the legacy of our own London Conference held in 2016. And it means supporting international efforts to reinvigorate the process to deliver a political solution, for this is the best long-term hope for the Syrian people. The UK will do all of these things, but as I have also been clear, that is not what these military strikes were about. Mr Speaker, as I have set out, the military action that we have taken this weekend was specifically focused on degrading the Syrian regime's chemical weapons capability and deterring their future use. In order to achieve this, there must also be a wider diplomatic effort, including the full range of political and economic levers, to strengthen the global norms prohibiting the use of chemical weapons, which have stood for nearly a century. So we will continue to work with our international partners on tough economic action against those involved with the production or dissemination of chemical weapons. And I welcome the conclusion of today's European Foreign Affairs Council, attended by my Right Honourable Friend, the Foreign Secretary, that confirmed the Council is willing to consider further restrictive measures on those involved in the development and use of chemical weapons in Syria. We will continue to push for the re-establishment of an international investigative mechanism which can attribute responsibility for chemical weapon use in Syria. We will advance with our French allies the new international partnership against impunity for the use of chemical weapons, which will meet in the coming weeks. And we will continue to strengthen the international coalition we have built since the attack on Salisbury. Mr Speaker, last Thursday's report from the OPCW has confirmed our findings that it was indeed a novichok in Salisbury, and I have placed a copy of that report's executive summary in the Library of the House. While of a much lower order of magnitude, the use of a nerve agent on the streets of Salisbury is part of a pattern of disregard for the global norms that prohibit the use of chemical weapons. So while the action was taken to alleviate humanitarian suffering in Syria, by degrading the regime's chemical weapons capability and deterring its use of these weapons. It will also send a clear message to anyone who believes they can use chemical weapons with impunity. We cannot go back to a world where the use of chemical weapons becomes normalised. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I am deeply conscious of the gravity of these decisions. They affect all members of this House and me personally. And I understand the questions that rightly will be asked about British military action particularly in such a complex region. But I am clear that the way we protect our national interest is to stand up for the global rules and standards that keep us safe. That is what we have done and what we will continue to do, and I commend this statement to the House. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I want to start by thanking the Prime Minister for our, co our phone conversation in advance of the bombing raids on Friday night and for an advanced copy of her statement today. I also join her in paying tribute to Sergeant Matt Tunro, the SAS sniper from Manchester who was killed on the 28th of March with US forces in northern Syria, and Master Sergeant Jonathan Dunbar from Texas who was killed in the same attack. I welcome the fact that all British military personnel involved have returned home safely from this mission. The attack in Douma was an horrific attack on civilians using chemical weapons, part of a civil war that has killed hundreds of thousands of people. Mr Speaker, this statement serves as a reminder that the Prime Minister is accountable to this Parliament, not to the whims of the US President. We clearly we clearly, need, we clearly need a War Powers Act in this country to transform a now broken convention into a legal obligation. Her predecessor came to this House to seek authority for military action in Libya and in Syria in 2015, and the House had a vote over Iraq in 2003. There is no more serious issue than the life and death matters of military action. It is right that Parliament has the power to support or stop the Government from taking planned military action. And, Mr Speaker, the BBC reports that the Prime Minister argued for the bombing to be brought forward to avoid parliamentary scrutiny. Will she today confirm or deny those reports? I believe, Mr Speaker, the action was legally questionable. 
And on Saturday, I just urge members to calm down because, in my experience, some of the members who shout from a sedentary position then also entertain the fanciful idea that they might be called to ask a question. And I wish to disabuse them of that idea. The Prime Minister was heard in an atmosphere <coughs> of respectful quiet. And order. And that will happen for the Leader of the Opposition as well. No ifs, no buts, no sneers, no exceptions. That is the position. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I believe that the action was legally questionable. And on Saturday, the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, said as much, reiterating that all countries must act in line with the United Nations Charter, which states action must be in self-defence or be authorised by the United Nations Security Council. The Prime Minister has assured us that the Attorney General had given clear legal advice approving the action. I hope the Prime Minister will now publish this advice in full today. The summary note references the disputed humanitarian intervention doctrine, but even against this the Government fails its own tests. The overwhelming humanitarian catastrophe due to the civil war in Syria is absolutely indisputable. But the Foreign Secretary said yesterday these strikes would have no bearing on the civil war. And the Prime Minister has reiterated that today by saying this is not what these military strikes were about. And Mr Speaker, does, for example, the humanitarian crisis in Yemen entitle other countries to arrogate to themselves the right to bomb Saudi airfields or their positions in Yemen, especially given their use of banned cluster bombs and white phosphorus. Mr Speaker, three United Nations agencies said in January that Yemen was the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. So will the Prime Minister today commit to ending support to the Saudi bombing campaign and arms sales to Saudi Arabia? On the mission itself, what assessment has the Government made of the impact of bombing related military facilities where the regime is assessed to store chemical weapons? What impact on the local people of chemicals being released into the local environment News footage shows both journalists and local, local people in the rubble without any protective clothing. Why does the Prime Minister believe these missile strikes will deter future chemical attacks? As the Prime Minister will be aware, there were US strikes in 2017 in the wake of the use of chemical weapons in Khan Shukun for which the UN OPCW team held the Assad regime to be responsible. In relation to the airstrikes against Barzai and Himshin Sar facilities, the Prime Minister will be aware that the OPCW carried out inspections on both those facilities in 2017 and concluded, I quote, that the inspection team did not observe any activities inconsistent with obligations under the Chemical Weapons Convention. Can the Prime Minister advise the House does she believe the OPCW were wrong in that assessment, or does she have separate intelligence that the nature of those activities has changed within the last five months? And in the light of the Chilcot inquiry, does she agree with a key recommendation about the importance of strengthening the checks and assessment on intelligence information when it is used to make the case for government policies? Given that neither the UN nor the OPCW has yet investigated the Douma attack, it is clear that diplomatic and non-military means have not been fully exhausted. While much suspicion rightly points to the Assad government, chemical weapons have been used by other groups in the conflict. For example, Jaish al-Islam, which was reported to have used gas in Aleppo in 2016, amongst other groups. It is now vitally important 
that the OPCW inspectors who arrived in Damascus on Saturday are allowed to do their work and publish their report into their findings and report to the United Nations Security Council. They must be allowed to complete their inspections without hindrance. And I hope the UK will put all diplomatic pressure on Russia and Syria and other influential states to ensure they're able to access the site in Douma. The bigger question must be that during the Syrian conflict, over 400,000 Syrians are estimated to have died in the conflict, and the vast majority by conventional weapons, as the Prime Minister indicated. The UN estimates that 13.5 million Syrians are in need of humanitarian assistance, and there are over 5 million refugees. It's more important than ever that we take concrete steps to halt and finally end the suffering. Acting through the UN, the Prime Minister should now take a diplomatic lead to negotiate a pause in this abhorrent conflict. This means engaging with all parties that are involved in the conflict, including Iran, Israel, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Turkey and the US, to ensure there is an immediate ceasefire. We have, Mr Speaker, the grotesque spectacle of a wider geopolitical battle being waged by proxy, with the Syrian people used as pawns by all sides. Our first priority must be the safety and security of the Syrian people, which is best served by de-escalating this conflict so that aid can get in. So will the Prime Minister now embark, as I hope she will, on a renewed diplomatic effort to try to bring an end to this conflict, as she indicated in the latter part of her statement? The Prime Minister states that diplomatic processes did not work. This is not exactly true. The initiative negotiated by John Kerry and Sergei Lavrov led to the destruction of 600 tonnes of chemical weapons overseen by the OPCW. No one, Mr Speaker, disputes that such diplomatic processes are difficult and imperfect. But that should not stop us from continuing diplomatic efforts. The refugee crisis places a responsibility on all countries. Hundreds of unaccompanied children remain in Europe, and the UK has yet to take even in even the small numbers it was committed to through the Dubs Amendment. I hope that today the Government will now increase its commitment to take additional Syrian refugees. Will the Prime Minister make that commitment today? Yeah. Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. If I can start off by responding to the comments that the Leader of the Opposition has made on the Syrian conflict more generally, because I, everybody in this House recognises the nature of the conflict and the impact that it has had on the Syrian people, the millions of people who have been displaced either within Syria or to uh, countries in the uh, surrounding region. Uh, we have, as the United Kingdom, as I said in my statement, we are now the second biggest bilateral donor to the, uh, to Syrian for Syrian refugees in the region at almost £2.5 billion. We've been very clear that we, want, we believe we can help more people by giving that aid in the region, and we have been able to support hundreds of thousands of children in the region uh, by the aid that we have given to them. We will continue to do that and continue to support and continue to be grateful for all that is being done, particularly by Turkey, the Lebanon and Jordan, to support refugees in the region. This is a significant uh, task for those countries and we are supporting them in that effort. I also said, the Right Honourable Gentleman also asked me to uh, launch a new diplomatic effort. As I said in my statement, we will indeed 
be continuing uh, the work in relation to this wider issue of the conflict in Syria. That means, as I said, continuing the fight against Daesh and concluding the fight against Daesh. It means our humanitarian work, as I have uh, said, and continuing to press for humanitarian access. And it also means supporting the international efforts to reinvigorate the process to deliver a long-term political (coughs) solution in Syria. Um, But it is necessary for all parties to be willing to come together to ensure that they can uh, and to discuss and and, uh, develop a long term solution for Syria. Now, let me come on to the specific strikes that took place at the weekend and the issue of chemical weapons. The Right Honourable Gentleman asked about the legal basis. We have published the legal basis for our action. Uh, And I have been very clear, I went through the arguments in my statement, this is about the alleviation of humanitarian suffering. Uh, That is a legal basis that has been used by governments of all colours. It was used, as I said, in 1991 and 1992. It was also used by the Labour government to justify intervention in Kosovo as part of the NATO NATO, uh, intervention. He refers refers to other uh, areas of conflict in the world. Can I just say to him, What sets this apart particularly is the use of chemical weapons. This is about alleviating the suffering that would come from the use of chemical weapons. But I believe it is also important, and in this country's interest, and the interests of other countries around the world, that we do re-establish the international norm that the use of chemical weapons is prohibited. We cannot allow a situation to develop where countries and people think that the use of chemical weapons has been allowed to become normalised. And that that is uh, important for us all. He talks about the OPCW and about the intervention of their investigation in Douma. As I said in my statement, the problem is they are being stopped from their investigation in Douma. The regime and the Russians are preventing them from doing that. And moreover, again, Um, The regime has reportedly been attempting to conceal the evidence by searching evacuees from Douma to ensure that they are not taking out of the region samples that could be tested elsewhere. And a wider operation to conceal the facts of the attack is underway, supported by the Russians. He talks about other groups that have uh, 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 and the possibility of chemical weapons being used by other groups. As I pointed out in my statement, uh, this is, uh, it is understood that these chemical weapons were deli- uh, delivered by barrel bombs. Uh, barrel bombs are normally dropped from helicopters. There is the evidence that I cited in relation to regime activ- helicopter activity in Douma on the, uh, on the date in question. And it is not the case that the groups that he has referred to have access to the helicopters and barrel bombs that will be able to ensure to deliver such a chemical weapons attack. I think it is clear, and it was on that basis that the government uh, decided to act together with the United States and France. And I think it is important that this was a joint international effort that took place uh, in relation to these strikes. These strikes were carefully targeted. A proper analysis was done to ensure that they were targeted at sites that were relevant to the chemical weapons capability of the regime. We did this to alleviate further human suffering. We targeted it on chemical weapons capability of the regime to degrade and deter uh, the willingness of the regime to use chemical weapons in future. And I continue to believe it was the right thing to do. Mr Kenneth Clark. Uh, Mr Speaker, I I fully support the proportionate targeted action that we have taken against these sites, and I hope the government would consider similar action again in future if anyone is so foolish as to repeat chemical weapons attacks. Uh, we can all debate these matters, but it takes a real Prime Minister to actually face up to the yeah. But on the question of the parliamentary role, Uh, I think the Prime Minister was not relying on the archaic, narrow interpretation of the royal prerogative, which no government has invoked in this country for over 50 years. They've always come to Parliament for debate and votes, if possible, on any military action. Uh, And she says there was a problem of time, but surely 
Once President Trump had announced to the world what he was proposing, a widespread debate was taking place everywhere, including many MPs in the media, but no debate in Parliament. So would she consider setting up, once the immediate uh, issues are over, a, a cross-party commission of some kind to set out precisely what the role of Parliament is in modern times in the use of military power against another state, and what exceptions, if any, there can be to the usual rule that the government needs parliamentary approval for taking grave actions of this kind. Can I first of all thank my right honourable and learned friend for the comments that he's made about the action that was taken in Syria by the US, the UK and France. He refers to the parliamentary position. Um, the the decision to act was taken on the basis that, first of all, obviously an effort was made in the United Nations Security Council to uh, find, uh, put forward a resolution and to get that passed that would have enabled investigation and accountability for these chemical weapons attacks to be determined. Uh, that was vetoed by the Russians, so that it was not possible to follow that diplomatic route. Uh, and the timing was such that enabled proper planning to take place so that this was a targeted and effective set of strikes, um, that it was done in a timely fashion, and also that it maintained the operational security of, uh, of our armed forces. And any Prime Minister who commits uh, any of our armed forces into uh, action of this sort must have a care for their safety and their security in doing so. Can I also refer my right honourable and learned friend to the written ministerial statement in 2016 on the War Powers Convention which said at the end of it the following, after careful consideration, the Government has decided that it will not be codifying the Convention in law or by resolution of the House in order to retain the ability of this and future governments and the armed forces to protect the security and interests of the UK in circumstances that we cannot predict and to avoid such decisions becoming subject to legal action. It continues to say we will continue to ensure that Parliament is kept informed of significant major operations and deployments of the armed forces. Uh, that is what I have done today. I have come to Parliament with a, a statement on the action that took place. As I said in my statement, uh, Parliament will hold me to account for the decision that has been taken. Yes. Yes. Ian Blackford. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister on the sad demise of Sergeant Turnro and pass on condolences to his family and friends? Can I also thank the Prime Minister for the phone call ahead of the engagement uh, at the weekend, as well as advance sight of her statement today? All of us, I think, in this House have an absolute revulsion on the use of chemical weapons, and we need to work here and internationally to make sure that we remove the scourge of chemical weapons from the landscape in Syria and indeed and elsewhere. The Government now seems to have accepted that this House needed time to debate Syria. But why have we had to wait for today? When the Prime Minister called the Cabinet meeting last week, she should have recalled Parliament. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister leads a minority government. As was the case with the action against Daesh in 2015, this only happened with parliamentary approval. Yeah, yeah. It was perfectly possible for the House to have been recalled in advance of Saturday's morning's airstrikes. Why was this not done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what does this mean for the PM's position if there are further chemical attacks in Syria? Will she continue to authorise military action without consulting and without the authorisation of Parliament? I'm glad to hear the Leader of the Opposition support our calls for a War Powers Act, because yeah, this is yeah. the best way to protect us from getting into this situation again. Mr Speaker, has the Government learned nothing from the Chilcot Review? Once again, we have been dragged into military action with little regard for the humanitarian situation on the ground and no long-term strategic plan. The human suffering in Syria knows no bounds. Hundreds of thousands dead. Millions fleeing for their lives and 400,000 civilians still trapped in appalling conditions, deprived of food, medicine and basic aid. Over 13 million civilians in desperate need of humanitarian aid. Will the Prime Minister revisit the issue of refugees, particularly child refugees? 
we must do more than we have been doing. Why was action taken before international weapons inspectors completed their investigation? In February, the Prime Minister told me in this House that she was committed to finding a political solution for Syria. Why then did the UK not support Sweden's draft UN resolution calling for an international investigation into chemical stockpiles <coughs> reportedly held by the Syrian regime? Yeah. Mr Speaker, is the PM as surprised and concerned as I am at the US President's language that the situation in Syria was mission accomplished? Yeah. Yeah, she's not Who does she agree with, the US President or the UN Secretary General, who, like most of us, is clear? There is no military solution to the crisis. The solution must be political. Yeah. Yeah. Can I uh, first of all say to the Right Honourable, he's raised a number of issues there. On the question of refugees, and particularly child refugees, and I recognise that this is an issue that has been of concern to members across this House um, for some time and uh, has been raised in this chamber on a number of occasions. Obviously, we uh, have took the decision that we could help and support more children, more refugees in general, uh, men and women as well as children, by acting in the region. Uh, and that is why we have, and as I've said, we've become the second biggest bilateral donor to the region. But we also took the decision that there were a number of uh, refugees who are particularly vulnerable, who perhaps required particular medical support, who it was right to um, bring to the United Kingdom under our commitment on the um, Vulnerable Refugees Resettlement Scheme, which we have, uh, which Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme, which we have been putting in place and continue to put in place. There are a number of other schemes that we are operating to bring refugees, children in particular, here to the United Kingdom. But we continue to ensure that we are supporting the greatest number possible of refugees by actually acting in region, and I think that continues to be what we should be doing. He asked me about the issue of, um, of Parliament, and it is, I mean, is I am sure that he would recognise that it is the case that it is always uh, necessary for the government to be able to act in those circumstances where decisions need to be taken but to ensure that if a decision is taken which has not been discussed by Parliament, uh, that an opportunity for Parliament to consider that, to discuss it, to ask questions on it, is given at the first opportunity. That is exactly what we have done in this particular circumstance. We have also, we have also uh, been as open as possible in terms of publishing a le the legal basis for which we have, uh, on which we have taken this decision and making information available to a number of parliamentarians on a Privy Council basis uh, and trying to ensure that we can provide the maximum possible briefing, uh, commensurate, of course, with the fact that some of the intelligence that we have and have operated on is not intelligence that it is possible to share with Parliament. But we will be as open as possible with this Parliament. As I say, I will continue to answer questions from this Parliament on this issue. Mr. Rian Duncan Smith. Speaker, may I say to my right honourable friend that given the nature of her narrow target uh, of stopping Syrians using chemical weapons further and of the need to take swift action, I commend her for taking that, notwithstanding the fact that others have criticised her for not coming to Parliament. Coming to Parliament is a must, and the Prime Minister has done that today and will do it later on as well. But can I also raise the issue that the Russians and the Syrians are blocking the OPCW from going in to the target area, and I understand there's a lot of clean-up and change taking place while that block is taking place at the same time. So I have a simple question to ask, my right honourable friend. Given the confusion of some, who are a bit uncertain about who is the greatest threat to world peace, does she think that it is Russia or America? Yeah. <laughs> well, can I say to my right honourable friend that I think people, who, people are seeing from the actions that Russia has taken in support of the Syrian regime, uh, but as, uh, as my right honourable friend has pointed out, what we are seeing in Syria at the moment in relation to Duma is that efforts are being made to ensure that it is not possible for the inspectors to, to, to be a OPCW to be able to go in and to ascertain the truth of what happened in Douma. 
We uh, took a decision, we assessed together with our allies, and the assessment was agreed amongst the, uh, uh, the three parties that took place in these strikes uh, that the, all the, the evidence that we had seen from open source reporting, the reporting of NGOs, the reporting of the World Health Organization, that this was a chemical weapons attack, and as I've I indicated, a number of, uh, of pieces of information and intelligence that showed that it was highly likely this was undertaken by the Syrian regime. But my right honourable friend is right. Uh, actually, more could have been done by the OPCW if Russia had not vetoed the resolution in the United Nations Security Council. It would be possible to make greater efforts on the ground to establish uh, uh, now uh, what had happened in Douma if Russia and the regime were not blocking the opportunity for the OPCW to go to the site and if efforts were not being made by the regime to ensure that material from the site is not available for that sort of analysis. It is quite clear uh, that every effort is being made, and this is why I pointed this out in uh, my statement in relation to comments the Leader of the Opposition had made. It is perfectly clear that Russia is preventing, is stopping, is blocking our opportunities to ensure that we can properly hold to account those responsible for chemical weapons attacks in Syria. Yeah. Sir Vincent Cable. Um, I also regret, Mr Speaker, that the Prime Minister did not seek the prior approval of Parliament, especially as at least some of her arguments are compelling. But can I ask a, a question uh, of the member for Rushcliffe, which he didn't answer, is that if the Syrian regime is now foolish enough to use its residual stocks to attack other holdouts like Idlib, does the Prime Minister intend to order fresh strikes, or is it, in the words of President Trump, a one-off operation and mission accomplished? Can I say to the, the right honourable gentleman, that this was a limited and uh, targeted set of strikes that took place uh, with, uh, between the United Kingdom, the United States and, uh, and France. The intention of those strikes and the targets, targets were carefully chosen. Uh, the intention was to degrade the chemical weapons capability of the Syrian regime and to deter its willingness to use those chemical weapons. Uh, nobody should be in any doubt of our resolve to ensure that we cannot see uh, a situation where the use of chemical weapons is normalised. Sir Michael Fallon. Would the Prime Minister accept that the public well understand that when our forces need to act quickly and decisively and safely in concert with our allies, it must be right to authorise strikes without giving notice? Is it further not clear that if the use of chemical weapons goes completely unchallenged. We are going to see dictators in other countries using these awful weapons to suppress opposition. Well, can I thank my right honourable friend for his comment? And in fact, when I uh, quoted from the written ministerial statement in 2016 earlier, it was in fact the written ministerial statement, I believe, in my right honourable friend's name, where it was clear it said, We must ensure the ability of our armed forces to act quickly and decisively and to maintain the security of their operations uh, is not compromised in observing the Convention. And it's important that we are able to, uh, to do that. And I absolutely agree with my right honourable friend. Yvette Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This was clearly a vile attack by Assad on his own people, and we have a responsibility to consider how to respond whilst also not escalating global, global conflict. But Parliament has considered these kinds of complex issues before. We have voted for and against military action. We have got things right and got things wrong, and so too has the executive. And the Prime Minister and her Cabinet appear today to not just be arguing about the circumstances of last week, but also to be rejecting the entire principle of consulting, debating and voting in Parliament in advance of military action. Given the importance of us pioneering democratic values across the world, can she clarify her position on this and say how important she thinks it is for Parliament to decide issues of war and peace? Can I say, can I say to the right honourable lady, it is not a question of the government rejecting that. Uh, it is, if I can return again to the written ministerial statement, which observed that the Cabinet Manual states that in 2011 the Government acknowledged that a convention had developed in Parliament that before troops were committed the House of Commons should have an opportunity to debate the matter 
and said that it proposed to observe that convention except the where there was an emergency and such action would not be appropriate. It then goes on subsequently to refer to, to references after that, but says, as I have just said in uh, response to my right honourable friend, the member for Seven Oaks, in observing the convention, we must ensure that the ability of our armed forces to act quickly and decisively and to maintain the security of their operations is not compromised. Uh, and where it is the case that the government takes a decision and acts uh, without a debate in Parliament, as has happened in this, uh, on this occasion, it is right that I come to Parliament at the first opportunity to explain that decision and to give members of this House an opportunity to question that and to hold me and the government to account. Tom Tugendhat. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I can only imagine the burden on the Prime Minister's shoulders as she took uh, the onerous decision she took. I can only say that from the other side, receiving orders like that is about the most sobering thing you can ever get. May I congratulate her on having taken action that I believe to be not only legitimate but right and indeed urgent. And I congratulate her and her colleagues and indeed our international partners in standing together on this. May I also ask her, however, if she will reinforce the efforts of the Foreign Office, because few have been shouldering the burden as heavily as Karen Pearce in the United Nations, although others in our diplomatic network have done so. Would she not agree with me that the role of the, the Foreign Office is to promote the aims and interests of our government and our people who are, we are here to represent, and not to wait for a veto and the order that Moscow says no. Well, I absolutely agree with my honourable friend that it must be this, uh, the UK government that determines UK foreign policy, and we must not hand over uh, our foreign policy to a Russian veto. It is absolutely essential that we determine our foreign policy, and, the, and that the Foreign Office, of course, is a key part of delivering that. Mr. Hillary Benn. <laughs> very much, uh, Mr Speaker. There are many who support the principle of humanitarian <laughs> protection, what it achieved in Kosovo and Sierra Leone, and what its absence cost in Rwanda and indeed in Syria. And of course we must uphold the international prohibition on the use of chemical weapons. But as someone who supported military action against Daesh in Syria in the vote in December 2015, may I say gently, to the Prime Minister that she should have come first to the House yeah, 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 before yeah, yeah. committing our forces to action. And therefore, may I ask her to give us an assurance that in the event, heaven forbid, that President Assad chooses to use chemical weapons against innocent civilians once again, that she will come to Parliament first, that she, she, she will share such evidence as she can with us, as she has done today, and that she will trust Parliament to decide what yeah, yeah. is to be done. Yeah, 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 yeah. Say to the, the, uh, the right honourable gentleman, as I, uh, I set out the basis on which we took this decision in the statement that I have just made, and I recognise the importance and significance of Parliament and Parliament being able to make its views known on these issues. But it is also important that the government is able to act in the will always be circumstances in which it is important for the government to be able to act and for the operational security of our armed forces to be able to do so uh, without that debate having taken place in Parliament. There will be circumstances where that is the case. That's, the government has consistently set that out. As I said, if those are the circumstances, then uh, it is right that the, government comes, the Prime Minister comes to Parliament at the earliest opportunity. But in relation to the reference he's made to potential future action, uh, as I said in response to the right honourable gentleman, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, uh, this was a targeted attack. It was targeted on the degrading of the chemical weapons capability of the Syrian regime, uh, and it was undertaken. We now uh, look alongside that to undertake international work and diplomatic and political channels to ensure that we reinforce the international norm of not using chemical weapons. But but nobody should be in any doubt, I think, about our resolve uh, that should be there to ensure that we do not see a situation developing where the use of chemical weapons is normalised. Mr Dominic Grieve. So thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, if the Leader of the Opposition persists on behalf of the Labour Party in changing its previous adherence to the previous rule of international law, justifying taking unilateral action in the event 
of there being a humanitarian necessity, does my right honourable friend agree with me that the consequence of that is going to be that any tyrant, yep. megalomaniac, yep. person intent on carrying yep. out genocide, yep. Yep. if they have the support of an amoral state uh, within the Security Council, yep. we'd be able to conduct that genocide yep. with total impunity. Even if it was within our power to act to prevent it. And does she agree with me that in those circumstances, far from upholding the international rules based system, the reality yeah. is, is that it would be dead? Yeah. Can I say to my right honourable and learned friend that I absolutely agree with him? He is, he is absolutely right. If we were, were to say that we were only prepared to act, uh, when we had the support of the United Nations, given that there is, as we have seen in this circumstance, a member of the UN Security Council who is willing repeatedly to veto the ability to investigate these issues, uh, then anybody, any tyrant uh, could, around the world could determine that actually they could act with impunity and they could use these weapons with impunity. We must not allow that. The use of these chemical weapons must be stopped. Mr Nigel Dodds. I associate my honourable and right honourable friends with the Prime Minister's remarks on the passing of Sergeant Tunro and his courage and valour is another example of the courage and valour of all our service men and women as exemplified in Syria at the weekend. Can I thank her for her call with me prior to the action on Saturday morning and thank her for her statement today and the cogent and well argued nature of that statement addresses the challenges of these difficult times in stark contrast to the contribution of the Leader of the Opposition in this House today. And given the fact that this is limited and targeted action, given the fact that diplomacy was tried and was unable, sadly, to succeed, the Prime Minister is utterly justified in the action that she has taken. And she should have the support of every right-thinking member of this House in upholding international law and defending the national interests of the United Kingdom. Can I, can I thank the right honourable gentleman? And he is absolutely right. This is we undertook this action because we believed it was the right thing to do. It was in our national interest, and I believe it is important that all of us across this House recognise the need to uphold the international rules-based order and do what we can to ensure that we maintain that rules-based order. Dr Julian Lewis. I welcome the calm and measured assessment of the Prime Minister, as I suspect do a considerable number of honourable members on the other side of the House. She mentioned the year 2011. Now, bearing in mind what happened in Libya after the House retrospectively approved air action in 2011, namely the toppling of the regime, will she give us an absolute and unequivocal guarantee that the use of airstrikes now, specifically, as she says, to degrade and deter chemical atrocities will absolutely not be allowed to lead to the Royal Air Force becoming, in effect, the air arm of the jihadist-led rebel forces in Syria. The two roles are and should be held to be entirely separate. My, my hon. Friend is absolutely right. They are separate. This was about the degrading of the chemical weapons capability. It was not about regime change. It was not about an intervention in the civil war in Syria. It was about the use of chemical weapons and the prevention of future humanitarian suffering. Liz Kendall. There are no easy solutions to the appalling humanitarian crisis and civil war in Syria. But Assad's repeated use of chemical weapons against his own people in violation of international law cannot go unanswered. Yeah. Can the Prime Minister tell us what her assessment is of Assad's chemical weapons capability after these strikes and what further and urgent humanitarian action she is planning to protect Syrian civilians. Can I say to the Honourable Lady, can I thank her for her words and say that uh, we are, of course, we continue to complete the assessments of the action, but the assessment of the strikes that took place uh, in the early hours of Saturday morning are that those strikes were successful. 
that they will have degraded the uh, capabilis, chemical weapons capability of the Syrian regime. Uh, but we will continue to ensure that we are encouraging humanitarian access to those uh, people in Syria who require that access. Um, again, there have been attempts through uh, the United Nations to encourage that access and, and so forth, and uh, sometimes those have not been successful, but we will continue to press because we believe it is important that we can ensure that support is available to those people in Syria who need it. Justine Greening. As the former Secretary of State for International Development, the harrowing stories that I heard from refugees, Syrian refugees, men, women and children, will stay with me for the rest of my life. Does she agree with me that on their behalf we simply cannot turn a blind eye to this breach of international law and there will be times when action is urgent and must be taken? And Does she agree with me that we cannot also allow countries like Russia and Syria to simply dictate our foreign policy through barring action? I absolutely agree with my right hon. Friend. Um, she has, as she said in her former role, she will have had the opportunity to speak with and hear from Syrian refugees about their experiences. I think nobody who has seen the pictures or read the descriptions of what happened in Douma uh, can think anything other than that this was an absolutely barbaric uh, act that took place and that it is right that we do uh, act in response in response to that and the continued use of chemical weapons, because this was about the continued use of chemical weapons and the potential for those weapons to be used in future. Ms Savile Roberts. The sight of children and adults suffering from the effects of chemical weapons cries out to all humanity for a humane response. But planning for war without equally robust planning for peace is anything but humane. Conventional and chemical weapons are indiscriminately horrific. In what way will this weekend's strikes prevent children from monstrous attacks in future? What we have undertaken is a limited and targeted set of strikes alongside our allies in the United States and France. The purpose of those strikes, and as I've just indicated in response to a previous question, uh, our ass assessment is that those were successful, was to degrade the capability of the Syrian regime to use chemical weapons, and it is that degrading of their capability, but also those strikes were intended to deter their willingness to use chemical weapons, and it is that degrading of their capability which we believe will have an impact and will uh, help to alleviate and ensure that we do not see the same humanitarian suffering in future. The Nicholas Soames. Will my right hon. Friend will agree that the use of chemical weapons by anyone, anywhere, under any circumstances is illegal, contrary to all the laws of war, and utterly reprehensible. Mm. And would she therefore confirm that the government will, at a later date, seek the arraignment at an international court mm -hmm. of those who instigate these vile acts, yeah. whoever they may be? Yeah. Can I say to my right honourable friend that he is absolutely right about the illegality of the use of chemical weapons and the impact of the use of chemical weapons, and we believe that those who are responsible should be held to account. Chris Leslie. The Prime Minister, that pinpointing and degrading uh, Assad's uh, chemical weapons was necessary uh, and appropriate, and that intervening to save uh, civilians from future gas attacks, while not without risk, was absolutely the right thing to do. Yeah. And would the Prime Minister also agree that a policy uh, of inaction also would have severe consequences? <laughs> And that those who would turn a blind eye, who would do nothing in pursuit of some moral high ground, should also be held accountable for once today as well. Can I, can I thank the right honourable gentleman for his comments? And I agree with him. I think we have to look. Many people focus on the impact of action. But actually, inaction would have given a message that these chemical weapons could continue to be used by the Syrian regime and indeed by others with impunity. And we cannot allow that to happen. The use of these weapons must be stopped. Yeah. Yeah. Patel. 
Yeah. 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 There are no words to describe the appalling nature of the humanitarian disaster confronting Syria, which is why I commend my right honourable friend for the very strong action that she has shown and also the support she's given to the Syrian people. Will my right honourable friend give an assurance that in the face of the abhorrent abuses perpetrated by the Assad regime, that she will continue to be a strong voice for the international rules-based system and show that Britain will not stand idly by when cruel weapons are used to murder innocent children and families? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I say to my right honourable friend, I absolutely agree with her. Um, we will ensure that our voice is heard. We, and I think it is absolutely right. I, this is the right thing to do. It was in our national interest, but it's also important that we are standing up for that international rules-based order and that we continue to do so. Ben Bradshaw. Britain, uh, Britain was absolutely right uh, it, with France and America to take this long overdue action in response to Assad's proven and repeated use of chemical weapons. His regime and the Kremlin have lied and lied again since 2013 on his continued development of his chemical weapons programme and their continued use. So will she reassure this House that if this does not prove to be a sufficient deterrent, she and our allies will not hesitate to act again, but I do urge her in those circumstances to come to this House and seek Parliament's consent first. Yeah, yeah. I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, he's absolutely right to refer to proven and repeated use of chemical weapons by the Syrian regime. And as I said earlier in response to a number of other questions, nobody should doubt our resolve. Nobody should be in any doubt about our resolve to ensure that we uh, leave the alleviation of humanitarian suffering uh, by dealing with this issue of the use of chemical weapons, but also our resolve to ensure that the use of chemical weapons is not normalised. Okay. Sir Edward Lee. The Prime Minister was indeed heard in respectful silence because her moderate and determined and sensible attitude deserves respect from this yeah. House. Yeah. But may I ask uh, a question on behalf of the persecuted Christians of the Middle East, who will face further persecution if it is believed that their sponsors in the West are taking sides in this civil war. So will she assure us that not just in terms of this airstrike, but generally, we are no longer in favour of regime change. We do not take sides. We are only on the side of peace. And can she look me in the eye and say that whilst we, backbenchers, can of course not have access to intelligence, she does, and having had that access, she is absolutely clear in her own mind that beyond reasonable doubt the regime was responsible for this attack. Well, can I, on the um, first point that the, uh, my honourable friend has uh, raised, can I say that I recognise the concerns about persecuted Christians in, uh, in this region, and indeed this is a matter which we're discussing with the Foreign Office, how we can look at this issue of uh, persecuted Christians, but also actually other religious groups who find themselves persecuted uh, in, uh, in wherever that might be, and including in this, uh, this region. And I can give my honourable friend the absolute assurance that from the intelligence that I have seen, from the analysis I have seen, from the assessments that I have heard, I am in absolutely no doubt that the Syrian regime was responsible for this attack in Douma. Caroline Lucas. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has said that the legal basis relies on there having been no practicable alternative to the use of force. Further to that, can she confirm exactly when the UK identified Himshin Shah as a chemical weapons storage facility and when they identified the chemical research facility at Barze as a chemical weapons research centre, when this information was reported to the OPCW and whether the UK has asked the OPCW to inspect both sites? I have to say to the Honourable Lady, we are very keen, we've been very clear that we would like it to be possible for the OPCW to investigate sites in Syria and for there to be proper accountability, proper identification of the chemical weapons and proper accountability for the use of those chemical weapons. This is, well, can I say to the Honourable Lady, 
Can I say to the Honourable Lady that last Tuesday in the United Nations Security Council there was a proposal, there was going to be a proposal, a resolution that would have enabled the uh, reintroduction of a proper investigative mechanism to uh, look at the use of chemical weapons and the, what chemical weapons were available in Syria and held by the regime. Uh, their capabilities and to uh, uh, be able to ascertain accountability for those chemical weapons. That re draft resolution was vetoed by Russia. Yes. Yes. Mr. Richard Benyon. Would uh, my right honourable friend agree that in the coming days, weeks, and months, the image that we must hold in our minds is of children coughing up their lungs? Yes. Yeah. And would she understand that many of us on all sides in this House want an executive? when it's planning a limited operation like this, to act, yes. and in the full knowledge that if it doesn't and tries to labour hop before the House at great length, we'll put at risk not only the operation, possibly the risk to our airmen, yes. and the complications of working with our partners. Yes. 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 Can I say I absolutely agree with my right honourable friend, and I think he's absolutely right. Uh, when we think about this issue, we should hold in our minds the horrific suffering of children and others in Douma as a result of the use of these chemical weapons. Stella Creasy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister just said that we should hold in our eyes the images of the suffering of those children, the human cost of the consequences of Assad and their Russian backers using chemical weapons against their people and it becoming normalised. But we know this is not the first time. So, with that in mind, can I beg? the Prime Minister to rethink her approach to those Syrians who have fled to Europe, because they are the same people fleeing this horror. They are the people who needed a safe haven, and with 40% of those in the Greek camps, Syrian, a third of them children, and only one Home Office official for the entirety of Greece to deal with the issue, do they not deserve more direct support from us too? Can I say to the Honourable Lady that the Home Office has been looking very carefully at this issue. We have uh, changed the uh, 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 arrangements that we have in order to ensure that there is a wider group of children that will be um, um, uh, fall within the remit of the proposals that we have for bringing refugee children into, into the United Kingdom. There are a number of ways in which we are ensuring that we do accommodate and offer shelter and security to refugees from Syria including refugee children. But as I said earlier, we must also recognise the many millions of people from Syria who have been displaced from their country, uh, both within their country and from their country. And I think it is right that we look to ensure that we can provide a, as much support as possible for them, and that is best done by supporting them in region. Yeah. Nikki Morgan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I offer my support to the Prime Minister, both for the action that was taken at the weekend, but also to her stance on Parliament. She's absolutely right that members of Parliament are there to scrutinise the decisions uh, of the executive, but it is the Prime Minister's right with her government to make the difficult decision that she did yeah, yeah, at the yeah, end yeah, of yeah, last week. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask her about a, a line in her statement? She talks about continuing to work with international partners on tough economic action against those involved with the production or dissemination of chemical weapons. Can I suggest to her that that should extend to those who are complicit in the use of chemical weapons, those who turn a blind eye to the use of chemical mm, weapons, yeah. and those who yeah, veto yeah. resolutions of the United Nations? Yeah. I'm talking about much tougher sanctions on Russia and Russian citizens. Yeah. 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 Right, can I thank my right honourable friend for her contribution and for the specific proposals that she has made? We will be looking very carefully at what further levers can be used. And as I said, I'm pleased that the uh, Foreign Affairs Council in uh, the the European Foreign Affairs Council has today agreed that it is willing to, to look at what further measures could be taken, but I will certainly take uh, on board and note the specific suggestions my right honourable friend has made. Order. It's always very good to be able to call a fairly new and young member, particularly when that member is celebrating her birthday. Oh. Paula Sheriff. All of us in this House agree that after the appalling scenes that we saw in Douma, there is a desperate need to provide humanitarian relief and medical care to the civilians who have fled the city and to also to those who have remained. So can the Prime Minister tell us what action she has taken to that end? Yeah. Well, can, I, can I first of all wish the uh, Honourable Lady a very happy birthday? Uh, 
uh, and uh, as I said, we will be continuing to work with our international partners, both to look at what more we can be doing in terms of our humanitarian support, but also in pressing for humanitarian access. As the Honourable Lady and others will know, this has been one of the problems time and time again. There have been groups of people within Syria who have been <laughs> suffering as a result of the, uh, of the conflict for whom it has not been possible to get that humanitarian access. We will continue to press at the international level for that access. Mr Crispin Blunt. On Sunday, the Leader of the Opposition on the Mar Show said that our exports that go to Saudi Arabia end up somewhere in very bad hands in Syria and other places. The Leader of the Opposition has rightly called for evidence uh, to support and for the government to be satisfied about this intervention. Uh, if you, on the one hand, demand evidence and then repeat malicious gossip, for which there is not only no evidence but is contradicted um, by the NGOs who are specialists in this area, you are guilty of very poor double standards. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I absolutely agree with my hon. Friend. Oh, yes, on the subject of new young members early in their parliamentary careers, uh, let's hear from Mr Barry Sherman. <laughs> Mr Speaker, it's not my birthday, but I was born... On the week in London, on the weekend of the worst weekend of the Blitz, August and my next door neighbour's family were killed, and the two children died that night. So, when I hear of a tyrant killing children, I want action. I have no criticism of the Prime Minister. I have one problem and demur. I am a passionate pro-American. I have been all the time I've been in this House. I, I see it as a beacon of, seen it as a beacon of our democratic world. But I have to say to thee, I was in the United Nations all last week when all this, this happened, on different business, and the conversations there were quite chilling in the sense many of us, passionate pro-Americans, couldn't remember a time when we were seriously worried about American leadership and the American president yeah. at the same time as we didn't trust Putin and his horrible gang. We need a Prime Minister and European leaders to show the way in these troubled yeah. times. Yeah. Don't you agree with me? Yeah. Can, I, can I say to the Honourable Gentleman... Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, I think what he has seen from the fact that the United Kingdom and France came together with the United States in this action, that actually there is leadership being shown in Europe on this matter, and we will continue to work with France, as I said, on the international uh, grouping that they have put together in relation to the pro on the uh, uh, prohibition of chemical use of chemical weapons. And uh, I think it is clear that Europe has taken a stance on this and has shown the way and the importance of the international rules-based order. You've been watching TikTok by Bloomberg's coverage of UK Prime Minister Theresa May's emergency debate in front of the House of Commons following last Friday's bombing on Syria. The Prime Minister uh, stood by the attack in front of Parliament and the opposition leader, Jeremy Corbyn, saying that the attack was morally and legally right. Uh, we're going to step away from this coverage, but you can get more updates at TikTok. Thank you for watching.